Namaste. Welcome everyone. Good to see you all and the visitors that are with us today. We, we welcome you with us and uh, trust that God is blessing you and will continue to do so as we continue. So for those that are visiting us, um, we've been going through the Gospel of John. And uh, I mentioned last week, uh, because we're coming into chapter 16 this week, we're going to look at the first half of that chapter. And I said last week that chapters 13, 14, 15 and 16 were very important because they uh, were the words that Jesus spoke exclusively to his disciples the night before he was crucified, the day before he was crucified. There were so many things that he wanted to uh, pour into their lives. Can you imagine if you knew the day that you were going to die and you've got your loved ones around you, what would you be saying to them? You wouldn't be saying, now, don't forget to put out the bin. <laughs> You'd be talking to them about important things, right? And that's what Jesus was doing here. He was pouring important things into the disciples for them and for us. And, uh, you know, we, he's going to talk about some of the suffering that was ahead for them, the persecution that is inevitable that they would begin to experience, but also that they would not be alone. They would have the Holy Spirit now with them, always. Never would he leave them nor forsake them. And so we're going to look at what he said in the first half of uh, this chapter. So starting at verse 1, John chapter 16. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So let's have a look at that. You would have noticed that I underlined those words will in that passage. There's a predictive nature about what Jesus was saying. And this continues in the verses that we're going to look at today. If, he said, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And this continues all the way through the chapter. Now, in chapter 15, which we just finished up, you remember that we were told, or they were told rather, what they needed to do. They needed to abide in Jesus and keep his commandments. His commandments were to believe in him and to love one another. Amen. And so that's what they needed to do. And Jesus taught them what they needed to do. But now he tells them what their enemies are going to do to prepare them, but also, more importantly, what God will do for them during this time, okay? So he said, I'm telling you this so that you do not stumble. Many of you have heard that this word is from the Greek skandalethron, which was a bait stick, a, a trap with a spring that might go off when least expected. So there was this trap, and there was a stick that um, had the bait on it, and once the animal stepped on the stick, it went off like a mouse trap, and they were trapped. There was no way they could get out. And so Jesus is saying, if you're not prepared for what I'm going to tell you, you'll be caught off guard, and you will stumble. There's a possibility you will stumble. You will, you will, it will catch you by surprise, and you'll be totally taken unaware. So I'm telling you th these things that are going to happen, lest you stumble. So he didn't warn them before. He said, I didn't tell you these before. Why? Because he was with them and was able to deflect the attention to himself. So he was the one that was persecuted. You don't read much of the disciples being persecuted when Jesus was with them. He took it all to himself. But now he was going. They would be in the front line and they would be targets for the persecution. Who's heard of William Tyndale? Many of you have heard of William Tyndale. He's a very important figure in church history. There was a time when the Bible uh, was kept from the people. In fact, in uh, England, in uh, every parish, there was one Bible only, and that was chained to the pulpit. And it was in Latin. <laughs> so you didn't have a clue what the Bible was 
saying. They, they wanted to keep the Bible from the people. And uh, William Tyndale had a different vision. He, he wanted this Bible translated into English, available for everyone, so that the man plowing the, you know, in the field could read it. Uh, just, you know, anyone could read the Bible and, and understand it for themselves. But he was persecuted to the point of being executed. I think he was burnt at the stake, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, when, when he was asked about the persecution, this is what he said. He said, I never expected anything else. <laughs> Jesus told us this. He said to expect this. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. You know, no, 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 no surprise. So in warning of them of what is ahead, he assures them that he has the reins. That's so important. That is so important. You know, that's why he kept saying, I, I'm telling you what's going to happen. I will, this will happen, this will happen. In other words, I know exactly what is ahead of you. I always say this, and you've, some of you have heard me say this many times. There's three things that have helped me all through my life. Number one, nothing can happen to me unless God allows it. God is in control. Amen. He's on the throne. Your life is not in the hands of fate. It's not in the hands of Satan or the hands of the, your enemies, those that don't like you. It's in the hands of God. Nothing can happen to you unless God allows it. Amen. Then secondly, if he allows it, he will give grace for it. Whatever you need, whether it's wisdom, whether it's guidance, whether it's support, whether it's encouragement, he will give you his grace at that time for every situation. And number three, he will ultimately turn everything around and make it work for good in your life. You may not see it at the time. In fact, it may be years later. But you'll look back and you'll see, I can see how God used that and turned it around and made it work for good. Amen. So he's saying, it's okay, these things are going to happen, but the fact that I'm telling you, you won't stumble because you're prepared and you know that the future is in my hands. The first thing he says is they will be excommunicated. Now, actually, we read about a man, didn't we, in John chapter 9 when we were there, a man who was excommunicated, a man who was born blind. Nobody had ever been healed who was born blind up until that point. And he was healed of blindness. And when the Pharisees saw that Jesus was starting to get attention because of this, they were concerned and they wanted to shut this man down. And they, they tried to say, well, he's, he's a sinner because he did it on the Sabbath or something like that. And the man said, no, he's a prophet. No, he's from God. And no one's ever done this before. And so, so does, does God open blind? Does the devil open blind eyes? And so on. And so in the end, they excommunicated him. Now, you've got to understand what that was. That was a very serious thing. Because socially, it meant that basically people didn't want to know about you if you've been excommunicated. But also economically, you were in a very diff difficult position. You couldn't buy or sell to a fellow Jew if you were excommunicated. Nobody would employ you, or if you were a businessman, nobody would want to work for you. And it was a very serious thing. In fact, when we were in chapter 12, I don't know if you remember, the Bible says that amongst even the rulers of the Jews, many believed in him, but they did not want to come out publicly because of fear of the Jews and fear of being excommunicated. Now, some of you have seen documentaries on TV of cults that wave that kind of fear over people. If you step out of line, you'll be excommunicated. And if you're excommunicated, your family members won't be allowed to talk to you ever again. And that happens. That's the power of religion. Amen. In fact, during the, the Dark Ages, um, there were times when the Pope was so powerful that kings had to submit to them. There's one king, I think it was the king of uh, Germany at that time. And, and, and he didn't agree with something the Pope said. And the Pope basically said to him, if you do not comply, I will excommunicate you and the whole of Germany. Which then, you know, the, 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 at that time the people thought we were not going to heaven because the Pope has excommunicated us. So they put pressure on the king and he ended up coming and bowing down to the Pope. That's the power of religion, friends. And Jesus said, this thing will happen. They will put you out of the synagogues. And, and you'll be disenfranchised in that sense. But also, he says, they, they will be killed by the religious hierarchy, thinking 
that this is doing service to God, thinking that they're pleasing God. Here's someone we know who was in that category, Paul, when he was Saul, before he was converted, you remember? The number one enemy of the church. And this is his testimony, he said, indeed I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem and, uh, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Just full of rage against Jesus, against Christians, against the church, wanting to stamp it out, thinking that it was doing service to God. Somebody sent a, um, a video, posted a video on a, a group that I'm a part of, and it was, it was quite horrific, actually. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a video of a Christian, a, a man who had just been converted from Islam to Christianity, to Christ, came and put his trust in Jesus. And then the, high, the, the, the uh, Muslim hierarchy came to him and tried to compel him to renounce his faith, and he wouldn't. So they took him outside of the town, and this video showed this, outside the town, and there were about 50 men there that stoned him to death. Stoned him to death. Now, I, I took the video down because I'm, I'm an administrator of that group, and it was just too graphic for the people. But, you know, as I'm watching that, I'm just thinking about his dear family and, and uh, you know, the, hor the, the horror of this whole situation. I'm asking myself, why do people do this? That's the answer. They think they're serving God. That's how deceived they are. They think they're doing service to God. Uh, incidentally, truth is usually on the side of the one who is persecuted. Truth is usually on the side of the one who is persecuted, not on the, the persecutor. We're not taught to persecute anyone. Amen? Christians do not persecute. In fact, it's a fact that amongst all the religious groups, the most persecuted are Christians. That's a fact. Okay. Opposition comes mainly from religious people and reveals that the persecutors do not know the Son nor the Father who sent the Son. That's what Jesus said. They do it because they, they have not known me and they've not known the Father who sent me. They worship a God of their own image, or if you like, take that word on, imagination. A God that they perceive him to be. They think they are serving God when they persecute those who are serving him. Remember Jesus said this? He said, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, what he's saying, these people would, were in total darkness and yet they thought they were in the light. They thought, this is what God wants us to do. So Jesus was saying, if that is their light, how great is the darkness that is within them? Not only are they doing the wrong thing, but they actually think that God approves of what they're doing. The light within a person leads them to attacking Christ's body, the church. How great is that darkness? You know, we've had, we've had people here over, over, the, over the years, occasionally, people wander in and they start attacking, attacking, attacking my preaching. And, they, you know, I, I've seen people take people on the side and try to, you know, turn them against what we're teaching here, the grace of God. And, and, and it's sad because... They actually think they're serving God in doing that. They think that this is what God wants them to do. How great is the darkness that's within them? Jesus said, but now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, remember that word, we looked at that word the other day, the parakletos, the one called alongside to help you. 
If I do not go away, he will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So, okay, Jesus has painted the black picture. You're going to be persecuted. There's going to be trouble ahead. But you're never going to be on your own. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he will come alongside you. He will come within you to help you. Now, when Jesus told them he was going away and they would face opposition, their hearts were filled with sorrow. But as he said, they weren't concerned about his future. He said, I'm going away. No one said, oh, where are you going? He was going to the cross, you know? He was going to face the horror of the cross. Nobody wanted to know about that. They were filled with sorrow about themselves. We're going to be left alone. <laughs> Pretty selfish, wouldn't you say? But it was in their best interest that he was going away because he would send the Holy Spirit to them and to us. When Jesus ascended, you know, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was, was at point. Why is that better for us? Well, we know the reason why. Because when Jesus was here, he could only be in one place at a time. And mainly that was in the land of Israel. He, I think once or twice he went across the border, but that was about it. But, but anyway, even when he did that, he could only be in one place at a time. But now he's gone. He sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is with us always. He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Jesus is here today through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is in the church down the road at the same time by the Holy Spirit. He's in every church over the Gold Coast where Jesus is Lord. Amen. He's there throughout this country, throughout the world where two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst. And that's been going on for 2,000 years. Now you can understand why it's to our advantage that Jesus would go away. In fact, they got it after the resurrection. Their whole life was changed. We, you can see that reference there. You can look it up in your own time. That When Jesus ascended into heaven, the Bible says as he went up, they worshipped him and they returned to the city filled with joy. Here they were filled with sorrow. You're going away. But now they were filled with joy. They knew their future was glorious. The future of the church is glorious because the Holy Spirit has been poured out and he's with us until Jesus comes back again. Though Jesus is in heaven, the Holy Spirit is with us on earth. What does he do? He gives us life, first of all. He gives us life. You know, we're born spiritually dead. We have a spirit. That's why we're different to every other species that God has created. We have body, soul, and spirit. Only humans have spirit. Why? Because God created us so that he could indwell us. But we were born dead because of Adam's sin, and we were born in sin. But when you put your trust in Jesus, you are born again. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside you. In fact, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You know, you used to have to go to the temple in, uh, the, in the Bible days. And if you, if you weren't living in Jerusalem, you had to make a pilgrimage to the temple. You are the temple. Where you are, God is. And where God is, is holy. Hallelujah. Also, he gives us his life, he indwells us, but he loves us. The Bible speaks about the love of the Spirit. And, and in fact, in Romans, it says that the, the, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the love of God recently and what that really is, the love that has existed eternally within the Godhead. The, the Father loves the Son. And that, is, that there's never been a time when that has not existed that's the source, the fountainhead of all love. And that love is in us. It's the Holy Spirit that brings his love into us. And you know what? I, I, I'm convinced of this, that he wants to fill us more and more with his love than we are ready to receive it. And so I, I, I say to you, just, just receive the Holy Spirit, even while we're, we're in his presence now. Receive the Holy Spirit as I'm preaching the word to you. Consent to be in love. That's all it is. Say, so, okay, Lord, I'll let you love me, okay? <laughs> That's what you want. <laughs> and he will. 
He will. He pours His love. The Holy Spirit pours His love upon us. Praise God. Who's at those times when just spontaneously that happens? No reason for it. You just feel the love of God coming upon you and coming within you. And, and all of a sudden, you just feel that joy rise up within you. That's the Holy Spirit. He leads you. He leads you in the right way. You're not led by the flesh, by your own understanding, but you're led by the Spirit now. He leads you in the right way. Praise God. He assures us that we are sons of God. When, when the devil wants to condemn us, the Bible says that we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby God says you are sons of God. Amen. And uh, wow, isn't that precious? He helps us with our prayers because we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit helps us to pray correctly. And also he seals us unto the day of redemption. In other words, he's going to be with you right until that time, just like we've just been hearing about Joseph. When we leave the body, go to be with him. The Holy Spirit will be with us right the way through our journey. He will never leave us, never forsake us. So that's why Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go. Because if I don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And he did. And he lives within us. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So there will be two major aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number one, to the world. The Holy Spirit is working in the world. Those who are not Christians. Why? He's convicting the world of sin. That's his ministry. Not the church. The world. Those who don't know Jesus. Because they need to know they need a saviour. Amen. So... That word convict is, is a very strong word in the Greek. It's the word elenko. And it actually means, it's, it's more than just reprove or to say, you know, that's wrong, you shouldn't do that or whatever. It actually means to convince them of that so they know it. And then there, there is a response or a reaction. He will undeceive the world. He will wake the world up from its sleep which Satan has sent the world into to wake up to the reality of God and their sin. Now, only the Holy Spirit can convince of sin. Preaching can't do it. God uses preaching. Witnessing cannot do it. But he uses witnessing. Arguments don't do it. That's why I don't get into heady arguments, academic arguments about the existence of God. Waste of time. You know, if, if you can talk somebody into becoming a Christian, somebody can talk them out of it. They need to be convicted in their hearts. They need a saviour and to open up their hearts to receive Jesus as their Lord and saviour. Now, how people respond to that is a matter of personal decision. You go to Acts chapter 2, the first, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and Peter preached that first sermon, you remember? And the Bible says they were convicted. Well, of course they would be because they were the ones that put Jesus on the cross. They said, what shall we do? And Jesus said, repent, be baptised for the forgiveness of your sins and this Holy Spirit that is convicting you, you will receive him. You'll receive him into your heart and life. And 3,000 people did that in one day. Wow, I love that. Then you come across to chapter 7 and, and uh, uh, Stephen is witnessing and the people are so convicted by the Holy Spirit, they had to block their ears. This, this is what they did. They put their hands over their ears. They couldn't hear it anymore. And they gnashed their teeth at him. And they ran at him. Eventually they did what we just heard about that man. Same thing happened to Stephen has happened to that man. They stoned him to death. They stoned him till he died. It's their decision. Paul is a different situation. Paul, as I said, the number one enemy of the church, thought he was pleasing God by persecuting Christians, putting them in prison and so on. And yet 
the Holy Spirit encounters him through Jesus and he's wonderfully converted. The number one enemy becomes the number one ambassador. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But it's a serious thing to resist and reject this work of the Holy Spirit. When God is speaking to someone, don't resist the Holy Spirit. Amen. Notice that the essence of sin is unbelief. Jesus said he will convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me. That's it. See, every sin can be forgiven except not believing in Jesus <laughs> because he's the only one that can forgive you. Amen. And when he forgives you, he forgives you everything. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. Every sin. Somebody said it this morning. Past, present, future. Forgiven. Forgiven. You are righteous now. Praise God. So he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness. See, righteousness is misunderstood. Righteousness, people think that's doing the right thing to make us acceptable to God. No, that's what the Jews thought. And Paul says that they, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, they've gone about trying to establish their own righteousness and they've not submitted to the righteousness of God, which is what? Not, a, not, not precepts, not commands. Righteousness is a person. Jesus Christ is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification and, and our redemption. So when you believe in Jesus who fulfilled all righteousness, that righteousness is imputed to you as your own. You are justified by God, declared righteous by him. And the Holy Spirit makes that clear. He's the one that teaches us that and makes it clear to opens our eyes to that. Now the righteousness that I'm talking about, that was confirmed by the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. You notice that Jesus said, of righteousness because I go to the Father. Now you think about it. Jesus declared that he was the way, the truth and the life. Well, he was either true or he was a liar. And you'll know by whether he stayed in the grave or whether God raised him from the dead. God would never have raised him from the dead if he deceived us, if he told one lie, if he said anything wrong. But he was raised for our justification. Let's read that in Romans 4. Speaking about Abraham, he says, Therefore it was accounted to him, his faith was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offences, but was raised because of our justification. Hallelujah. Jesus died for our sins. God raised him for our righteousness, our justification. So the Holy Spirit would teach these things. And he opens our eyes to these things so that we don't misunderstand righteousness. It's not about precepts that you follow. It's about what Jesus has done and is and then also judgment normally conviction of sin is followed by judgment but the holy spirit bears witness that there is something in between sin and judgment and that is the revelation of the righteousness of god in jesus christ which delivers from judgment so so we will not stand at the judgment the great white throne judgment to give account for our sins if you've put your trust in Jesus, you will not come into judgment. So it's better to have the Spirit of God to justify us rather than convict us. Amen? Amen. So, first of all then, he's coming to the world to do that, to convict the world of sin, of righteousness and the judgment. In other words, he's, he's working for the salvation of men and women. Through preaching, through witnessing, the Holy Spirit is working and only he can work in the hearts of people. But there's a second part and we're going to read about that now. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. 
He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So let's look at that. The second ministry is to the disciples, to us. First ministry is to the world. The Holy Spirit is working to convict of sin, righteousness and judgment. But then he's going to minister to the church. Jesus said that there were many things they still had to be taught. But at that time, they were incapable of understanding them without the Holy Spirit, who would come to guide them into all truth. Right? At that time, they were prejudiced. They were prejudiced. They, they thought that God was only interested in Israel. But the Holy Spirit had to teach them that there's a new day now. Those days are gone. The veil has been rent between the, the two and, and we're, we're one now. Their hearts were establishing, uh, set on establishing the messianic kingdom. Do you remember even after Jesus rose from the dead, they said, Lord, are you going to at this time establish your kingdom? They thought that Jesus was going to set up his throne there and then on earth. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons when that's going to happen. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come and tell you what your agenda is in this age. Amen. God's temporary rejection of Israel. They didn't understand that. That God was going to put Israel on the side as he put the Gentiles on the side for all those years. Now he was going to put Israel on the side and focus on the Gentiles, the nations. They didn't understand that. But the Holy Spirit had to teach them. The abolishing of the old covenant because it's been fulfilled now. It's gone. It's been superseded by a new covenant. Amen. The Holy Spirit would open their eyes to all these things and the bringing in of another order of priesthood that we're all kings and priests. Not just a certain tribe. We're all kings and priests unto God. Many things. In fact, most of these revelations were given to Paul. Amen. We know that because of what we read in his epistles. But, but he was given a thorn in the flesh, lest he be, be exhorted above measure through the abundance of the revelation. He had so much revelation from the Holy Spirit that he could have become puffed up. So he was given a thorn in the flesh, whatever that was. Okay. Before we can see, we need both sight and light. Okay? You think about it. You've got sight, but if you're in a room, say you go to a way and you're, you're in a hotel room at night and you, you have to get up to go to the bathroom and it's pitch black. You've got eyes, but you can't see. You know, you, you bang your shin on the, on the furniture or you walk into a wall or something like that. You've got eyes, but you haven't got light, right? Or imagine if somebody's blind and it's perfectly light as, as we have light here today but they cannot see it's light but they don't have sight we need sight and light so what am i saying here is we need the word of god that's our sight to show us what is truth and the bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of god may be complete notice that thoroughly equipped for every work in other words, that Bible you hold in your hand, that will equip you for the totality of your life and your ministry. Amen? You don't need philosophy. You don't need psychology. The Word of God will thoroughly equip you for everything God wants you to do and to be. Amen? Okay. That's, that's our eyes. But then we need... Light. We need to be enlightened as we read that word to understand what is God saying? What does he mean? So Paul says here, as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know, or might know, the things that have been freely given to us by God. Now, let me try to illustrate what Paul is saying there. I think many of us, have, if not all of us, have been judged at some time or another, right? People have criticised us, they've judged us. Now, you can judge what I do, right? But one thing you cannot judge is why I did it, right? My motive. And sometimes people misjudge because they think they know the motive of that person. They've judged. Only I know why I did it, right? I did something, you can judge the action, but you don't know why I did it. Only I know why I did it. So what Paul is saying there, nobody knows the, a man except the spirit of a man which is in him. Likewise, nobody knows what God is really meaning or saying in his word except the spirit of God. Amen. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to come and open up our eyes and our understanding. Otherwise, we read that word of God religiously, legalistically, get ourselves into all kinds of bondage and uh, defeat and failure. We need the Holy Spirit to come and show us the things that have been freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit to come and say, this is what the Father is saying in his word. This is what he's meaning. And, and make it clear to us. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. In John 14, 26, Jesus said that the Spirit would recall to them the past. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. You had that experience where all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, there's a verse. There's a verse in the Bible that says something about that. What is it? And what do you do? You Google it and then you find it. The Holy Spirit has brought it back to your remembrance. Or, or he brings back to your remembrance something that you heard in the past, but you didn't know it, like understand it, but he then gives light on it then at that time. Amen. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But in John 15, 26, he says the Spirit would testify of the present glory of Christ. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So as we go on in the Christian life, every day in the present tense, we're seeing new revelations about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is opening our eyes and our understanding to those wonderful truths that impact our lives. But here, what he's saying in John 16, verse 13, he promised that he would show them things to come, things concerning the future. Now, that's relevant for us right now because we're, I think you said it, uh, Lindsay, didn't you, earlier, that we're, we're living in a world where it's just going so crazy and we're, we're kind of asking the question, where's it all heading? And the Holy Spirit says, I can help you there. Yeah. I can show you exactly what's going to happen, how it's going to unfold. In the epistles, there, there are many uh, things prophetic, but in the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, you say, well, the book of Revelation, that's a, well, wow, that's a difficult book. No, it's not. It's a piece of cake. <laughs> it is actually. You get the big picture. It's a, God shows you everything that's ahead, how it's all going to come to a climax and then we're going to go into the beautiful reign of Christ on earth, then the eternal realm. Fantastic. Amen. Amen. Ask the Holy Spirit. Read the book of Revelation. Ask the Holy Spirit. Don't get bogged down with the detail. Just let him show you the big picture first of all. And then the other details will come to light later. But Christ is the centre of the Spirit's testimony. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. I've written there, this uncovers every lying spirit. You know, when people say, talk about manifestations of the Spirit, and, and there are manifestations of the Spirit, don't get me wrong, but if they do not bring us to Jesus, I'm sus. I, I don't really want to know, to be honest. If it doesn't bring us to focus on Jesus, if we're just having a, an ecstatic uh, experience, a, you know, a sort of a fuzzy sort of time, 
That's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. He's come to bring us to a greater understanding, to show us the things of Jesus, to unfold them to us. So he will get them to focus on Jesus by declaring truth about him. He will take the things of Jesus as his person, the humanity, the deity of Christ in one person, explain that to us, reveal that to us, and the work, the finished work of the cross. And he will reveal these to us. Quite honestly, if we can get a grasp of those things, 95% of our problems will be taken care of. Take really 100%. Because it's all about him. Putting him in his rightful place. Amen. The Holy Spirit takes what was given to the apostles and opens our eyes to see it also. What I'm saying there is this. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will teach the apostles. What did the apostles do? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they gave us the epistles. Okay? An epistle is not a wife of an apostle. Okay? An epistle is a letter that was written by an apostle. Okay? And, and so that's the truth that we have and we need today. And he opens our eyes to the Word of God. <laughs> okay. The Holy Spirit will not speak on his own initiative, but will reveal what the Father gave to the Son and which he taught. Wow, when I read that, the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own initiative. You know, every time I enter the pulpit, I need to take notice of that. I'm not here to speak on my own initiative, what I think, but to share what the Word of God teaches. And, and so is every other preacher, by the way. You know, when a preacher steps into the pulpit and he says, I want to show you something God showed me today, I'm not interested. Don't tell us what God has spoken to you in your heart. Tell us what God has spoken in his word. Open the word of God to us. Amen. Don't speak on your own initiative. But everything we need to know is in the word of God. We just need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to it. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much, so much that you know the future. You know, Lord God, what's ahead. Nothing takes you by surprise and you've already made preparation for it. Your grace is sufficient. But Lord, we thank you so much that you've sent the Holy Spirit and he come to live inside us. We're born again. We're indwelt by the Spirit of God. And Lord, we thank you that he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. He's going to continuously reveal Jesus to us, open our eyes to his wonder and his glory and his beauty and just continue to minister grace to us. So I pray that, Lord, we will consent to being loved all through this week. Would you say yes to the Holy Spirit? Just continue to receive the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, I pray. In his wonderful name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Praise God.